We start with international students coming to Canada in record numbers. Now, Canada on track this year. Check this number out here. This is amazing. 900,000 international students this year. That number has gone up quite a bit in recent years. And the government now expressing concerns about the system, including the pressure on housing supply in key markets, including, of course, in Vancouver. I've got immigration lawyer Colin Singer standing by to discuss here. First, let's have a listen here to the federal housing minister, Sean Fraser, uh, talking about pressure from international students in Canada. Have a listen. The International Student Program makes extraordinary uh, economic and social contributions to Canada. It contributes tens of billions of dollars uh, to our GDP annually. Uh, but what we've seen recently is there's been such rapid growth, given that the program is typically uncapped, that certain communities are having uh, difficulties managing with the population growth that it's attracted. Yeah. Yeah, you heard him mention the big money here that's involved with this issue as well. But I think we're seeing in, in certain, definitely in Vancouver, it does seem to be aggravating the housing problem. Let's discuss now with my guest, Colin Singer. Colin is an immigration lawyer. Immigration.ca is his website. Very pleased to welcome him. Colin, thank you for coming on today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, you bet. I appreciate it. And I think for a lot of Canadians, when we hear the number of 900,000 international students in the country this year, I think that might, that number might take people by surprise. Do you think Canadians realize how big this program is right now? Uh, no, I think it's, uh, it's a, a learning process right now. People are, are getting to understand uh, feeling those who are looking for accommodations, buying properties, uh, they're they're feeling uh, you know the the prices are skyrocketing, uh, but hidden in the background is this growing uh, in immigration number that's coming to Canada, and students currently are interestingly the biggest. Uh, silo of, of newcomers to Canada across all streams. Uh, and I think even immigration authorities are, are quite concerned that this stream has now become the number one and the largest of all streams coming to Canada. Yeah, I'm not surprised, but when you talk about 900,000, I mean, that's a huge, a huge number. And is it easy for international students to get into Canada? Like we heard the minister mention in that clip there that the program is uncapped. There doesn't seem to be any maximum limit on it. Is it, is it a, a fairly simple matter for international students to come to Canada and be allowed to enter here? Uh, typically not. Interestingly, the current Minister of Housing was the former immigration minister, and now yeah. he's mandated to fix this problem yeah. of uh, housing uh, shortages. Uh, but uh, it is not easy to become a student. An international student has to have quite uh, a strong financial profile to accommodate uh, one year uh, of living expenses. Uh, obviously, uh, housing will be very high on the list. And, and their tuition, which is upwards of three times the cost for a Canadian. So typically, a foreign student going to a, a, a three-year program or two-year college program would have to show upwards of $50,000 of finances uh, that's readily available, liquid, uh, dating back uh, at least six months, sometimes more, uh, depending on the visa office. So it's not easy. Okay, that's very interesting detail to know. Now, let's talk a little bit about the number of, of private institutions in Canada that seem to be growing rapidly as well to accommodate this, this demand here in Canada. I'll play another clip here, Colin, for you for, from the, the, the new federal housing minister, Sean Fraser, as you mentioned, the former immigration minister, as it happens. Here he is commenting about the number of private colleges that are springing up in Canada, too. Let's listen. What we've seen that I'm far more concerned with is an explosion of private colleges who are not necessarily subject to the level of oversight. And keep in mind, there's mixed federal and provincial jurisdiction here because provinces actually identify the institutions that have access to the international student program today. We've seen an explosion in the number of institutions who are actually taking students and rapidly growing. Okay, it's interesting to hear him discuss that in the number of rapid, rapidly growing number of private colleges and he seems to think that's a problem. Colin, your thoughts? Uh, I, took, I, I completely agree. Uh, the problem also is that 
uh, there's no oversight uh, on the performance of these colleges to monitor the students who are allegedly coming in uh, as students. Um, what has happened in the past two years is there were previous restrictions on students being able to work in Canada. Of course, they had to show good financial uh, profiles. And what happened with the post-pandemic uh, employers were having a hard time in many industries, food service, one of them, healthcare. Uh, students were, re the restrictions of 20 hours per week uh, working uh, were lifted so that students could work unlimited hours. What has happened, as, as we can see, is that the student numbers now planning to be 900,000 uh, across the entire silo uh, uh, are people who are allowed to work. Many yeah. agents overseas are encouraging students to completely ignore their student requirements. They don't have a plan to really study and they can just go and get an open, unrestricted work permit. And basically this student uh, body of, of numbers is, is just another work permit silo uh, that's added you know, in, a in a large number to the uh, current student numbers, uh, uh, work, uh, temporary workers, which in yeah. itself is about 600,000. So you have about 2 million people a year coming to Canada across all channels, of which 900,000 are students. And there's incentive for these colleges to, to become formed. And the revenue base is, is quite substantive when you're charging three times the uh, regular cost of a Canadian to go to their schools. Okay, so if you were allowed as an international student in Canada to work while you're in the country with no limit on the number of hours you, you were allowed to work, it sounds like the international student program to a, a great degree is more of like a, a temporary worker program rather than a rather than a study program is that what it has become in it's my opinion that it's our opinion that that is what's happening uh certain high source uh, destiny uh, high source uh, uh markets that are producing students coming to canada uh are are allowed to come and work while they're studying. A lot of these uh, study programs are just two-year colleges. They don't really lead to any uh, major long-term employment. Also bear in mind the student market is very important for Canada. Uh, upwards of 30% of all student holders ultimately become Canadian permanent residents. So it's a really good yeah. pool of people. So we don't want to harm that pool, but I think it's completely out of hand in the number of colleges and the fact that there's no monitoring, uh, there, there's, no, there's no oversight where schools have to ensure that the students who are coming there are, are in fact attending class and being full-time students. Yeah. Speaking to immigration lawyer Colin Singer, we're talking about the skyrocketing number of international students in Canada. Play another clip here for you, Colin, from the housing minister, Sean Fraser, and you'll hear him discuss the, the issue around increased work hours allowed for international students here, and he doesn't seem to be that, that worried about that part of it here in this clip. Let's listen. I was responsible for increasing the number of hours that international students could work so they could help contribute a solution to the labor shortage at the time and better equip themselves to have what they need to take care of themselves in their community. I remain an enormous supporter of the international student program. Okay, okay. so he takes credit there for increasing the work hours for international students and you heard him discuss there how it actually helped it help us to deal with the skill shortage and the worker shortage in Canada. I mean, isn't that more, I don't know, it's almost like an admission. It's not really a student program. It's more like a work program. Well, given the, given the fact that students come over here and you have instance, you, there are, there's data that shows some of these schools are bringing in students. They don't even have the per capita teaching capacity for these students. So there are a lot of abusers into, in, in this particular uh, industry. And if students were required to, I, I can be certain about this, if they put the 20 hour a week limit back, you would effectively uh, remove many uh, would-be students who really intend to come and work here full-time, don't really care about their post-secondary or whatever they're planning to study, and, and they would find other channels or other destinations. So I think uh, the, 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 the thought should be given, maybe not, you know, they're, they're looking at caps, although I highly yeah. doubt they're going to pose caps, but I think if they rolled back the 20 hour, put it back to 20 hours, you would see a very substantive change in the number of foreign students applying to come to Canada. 
Okay, what, now what about this idea of a cap on the maximum number of international students allowed into Canada? Because you have heard a couple of ministers sort of openly muse about this this week. Would they bring a cap in to limit the numbers? Do you think that's, you don't believe that's the right way to go? Well, first of all, it's important to, to, to acknowledge the word cap does not exist anywhere in our immigration system. Uh, what the government uses is our, our levels. Uh, the word mm -hmm. cap, it, you know, it, it's an American concept. Uh, for sure, they have caps and quotas. Uh, so we indirectly impose uh, certain levels that are target levels with a, a high and a low and a medium. Uh, it would never. It's never. It's never been. Our our phraseology has never included the, this concept, uh, and I highly doubt they're going to go down that road right now. Uh, there are other indirect ways to uh, achieve the result that that policymakers would want, and I suggest uh, putting a 20 hour put the 20 hour a week cap back uh, on the number of hours, and you will suddenly exclude. Uh, uh, thousands of would-be applicants who claim to want to study, but really they're just looking to work full time. Uh, so th those are those are my thoughts. The word cap really, I highly doubt it's going to find its way into any policy uh, uh, and, and any any legislation. Okay, we're following it closely to say the least. Colin, thank you for your your analysis on it today. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Groundbreaking moment for nuclear and what the prime minister knew. Are you tired of the same old news stories? Well, look no further than Keep Canada Weird, a podcast that explores the most bizarre and offbeat news stories from the Great White North. Tim Hortons to viral videos to dumb Canadian criminals. Keep Canada Weird covers it all. Tune in to Keep Canada Weird. You'll be surprised at what you find. The items that were stolen literally were nothing but butter tarts. Subscribe to Keep Canada Weird right now, wherever you get podcasts.